Stephen van Cannon, and welcome to Fencing Ireland Sits Down With, a new limited series where I have the pleasure of sitting down with some of the biggest names in Irish fencing to chat about their international experience. Today, I'm talking with John Besher Hayes, who attended the 64, 68, and 72 Olympic Games in Tokyo, Mexico City, and Munich. Um, make sure to stay with us to the end of our chat where I'll ask John about his favorite scoring points. John, thanks very much for joining us today. Pleasure, pleasure to be here. Um, I suppose to, to get us started, uh, tell us how you first got involved in fencing. Well, I started fencing when I was 13 years old. I started in St. Conrad's College, where Paddy Duffy was the coach. After one year, I joined Satanta Fencing Club, which was located in Fitzwilliam Square. And as we were living in Lower Leeson Street at the time, that was very convenient. Um, and um, it was there where I met Shirley Duffy, or Shirley Armstrong, as she was then, for the first time. Uh, as a direct consequence of joining Satanta, I improved so much that in my second year in school, I became the school champion. Uh, an unheard of feat, as I would have come up against much older boys, including Tom and Billy Rafter, Stephen O'Toole and others. I, I went on to win the school championship on three other occasions with the exception of 1960, where I spent most of that year, I lay in a hospital bed with a broken femur. Yeah. Okay. So that's the start as it were. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's amazing how the, the missed year sticks out to you so, <laughs> so distinctly. Um, uh, did you play any other sports when you were oh, watching? Yeah. Uh, I played all sports, football, rugby, tennis being the main ones. Uh, as I was a member of a very large family, I had 11 siblings. Being competitive was not an issue. You had to be competitive to survive. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and so what was it that made fencing, what grabbed you about fencing? Well, um, I, I, was very, I, I liked it from the word go, I'd have to say. Uh, but I'd also have to say that kind of rugby would have been kind of a preferred choice at that stage. But when I broke my leg in January of 1960, and I said lay in the hospital bed for a year, all complex sports were then a non-runner going forward. So kind of, I had to kind of give up uh, any thoughts of that. And in fact, I'd given up thoughts of really doing anything more uh, sport-wise. Uh, but I went down to uh, Sal Duffy on a number of evenings in 1961 when I had come out of hospital and um, I was there and was talking to people, such as Michael Ryan. Um, and at that stage, the Sal was located on Anglesey Road in what was then Marion um, Cricket Club. And after a few nights there, Prof Duffy came to me and said to me, listen, if you're coming down here to fence, that is grand, you're more than welcome. But if you're coming down here looking for sympathy, you can never just f off and leave us alone. And I sort of said, right, I'll show you. And that's what started me back in a big way. Okay, okay. Well, it, it, it definitely the kick you needed, so it sounds like. And so, yeah. and so that was in, in 61. At, at yeah. what point did your, did you start thinking about the Olympics becoming a reality? Because three years later, you were in Tokyo. Well, yeah, but I mean, I'd have to say, kind of, um, uh, you think that we're really kind of, I suppose the, the big thing was, as I said, kind of was a member of a large family. And I remember, all remember, that on a cold December morning in 1956, huddling around the, the radio early morning, listening to the commentary on the 1500 meters from Melbourne Olympics. And listening as Raymond Glenn Denning commentated on the race and saying nothing, you know, much until finally, he didn't mention Ryan Delaney throughout the race until finally he screams, It's the green, it's the green, Delaney has won. And I thought at that stage, now that's something I want to do. Uh, and that was the start, the truth be told, you know. Yeah. Now, that obviously, became more. Um, I mean, I never thought of kind of a 64 kind of that, you know, would come that quickly. Um, but it, it came quickly and partly because, you know, there was a group of us, kind of including Michael Ryan, uh, 
and people like Nula Parker, as she was then. Um, and we all went off to the Junior World Championships in Ghent in mm -hmm. uh, 1963. And that kind of gave me the, my first day of international competition, you know, and that kind of yeah. was really kind of what started the train going. And then kind of did a lot of, did a lot of international fencing from there on in. Mm -hmm. um, it was very difficult because um, there was no question of kind of a financial support from anybody other than uh, 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 um, you know, your family. Uh, because at that time, in 1963, I commenced as an article clerk, earning the princely sum of £60 a year, a fiver a month. Okay. Uh, uh, and I, I oft times tell the story, kind of, and I was away a lot, kind of, you know, my mother, my father had died in 1960 as well, so kind of, we were not well off sort of things, so kind of, um, but she did everything she could to help me. But I remember kind of uh, in, when I was selected to go to Tokyo, I went into my den boss and said, I'm looking for time off for the three weeks to go to Tokyo. And he was most reluctant. And I said, here am I, here, and, you know, 60 quid a year sort of thing. Kind of, <clears throat> and I'd already made up my mind kind of, uh, and if he didn't say yes, I was going, I was leaving the firm. Um, but um, so he was making a big song and dance about it. And eventually he said to me, you know, you've been away on a lot of, you have taken a lot of time off to go off this fencing thing. And I'm letting you go on this occasion, provided it does not create a precedent. So I saw that. So off, that was it then. Okay. Um, I mean, the other thing I, I, I am part of kind of, was I, I tell the story against one of my brothers that, the night I learned, I was selected to go to Tokyo. I, uh, I was over the moon, you know, literally over the moon. And I ran, I was in the cell down the Sandy Mount, and I ran all the way home, wow. thinking to myself, I'm selected to go to Tokyo, I'm selected to go to Tokyo. <laughs> and then I got into the hall door in Leeson Street, and I met my brother David. And I said to him, I'm selected to go to Tokyo, I'm selected to go to Tokyo. And his response was, so what? <laughs> Good way the of the family, huh? Yeah, keeping keeping you grounded anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. Obviously, huge, exciting news to find out that you're selected to go to Tokyo. How how was it then that your mindset changed over the over the next twelve years to keep going? It's only eight. Oh, it's, well, sorry. Yes, sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Um, um, as I said, I'm, I'm competitive. You know, and kind of, you, you know, you love, you love, and to be perfectly honest, I loved winning, you know, and kind of, uh, and so you, you went in, kind of, you, you gave it your all, uh, you know, to try and win, and that was kind of, you just, just kept going. And, you know, I'd like to say, kind of, when I retired at all, it all, it all went away. It doesn't. Uh, you know, kind of, um, I took up golf and became competitive with it, then, you know, sort of things, yeah, yeah. at a lower level, much lower level, but I mean, honest. The way it was, you know. Mm -hmm. And and so, what sticks out in your mind from the three different Olympics? Well, I suppose if you take kind of them all, um, how how things changed over the time. Uh, I remember kind of I was gobsmacked to be in Tokyo, kind of, and sitting down to breakfast or lunch, kind of, with people such as Peter Snell, the kind of you know, kind of, I don't know, but the name might mean anything to kind of. He was current generation, but he was a fabulous New Zealand runner, you know, and sort of thing, being in their company. You know, oh, what do I have? This is fabulous. So at that stage, kind of the, the Olympic Village in, in Tokyo was a former American army camp. Okay. And um, the ladies' section was cut off by a very big, very high barbed wire uh, with uh, armed sentries walking around it. And remembering uh, the, the press sisters sort of thing and the pressure on them. Mm -hmm. um, we moved on to uh, Mexico, where the scene was somewhat different. The fence had come down to about um, eight foot. And um, uh, there was an occasion when an Australian pole vaulter pole vaulted over the fence to get into the ladies' section. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, um, and another, and then 
moving on to Mexico, well, there was no offence at all. And in fact, uh, after moving on to Germany, should I say, there was no offence at all. In fact, the, the Germans have been very clever. They employed students uh, all around the Olympic village, and they were given access to all of the social activities. So suddenly you had a balance of the genders at the discos and all that sort of thing. So kind of the, the evolution was quite extraordinary in its own way. Mm -hmm. sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's quite amazing to hear, as you said, barriers slowly dropping and, and, and then disappearing. Um, and thinking about your performance then over the three, well, I, you competed in more than one event. So, so how, how do you look back at, on your fencing? And um, you'd have to say with disappointment okay. uh, uh, in the wall. Kind of, we didn't perform, kind of, um, uh, you know, as well, well we might kind of at that. At, certainly in '64, I would have been regarded as being uh, a foilist from primarily, and I was knocked out in the first round. The foil was beaten and got, got into the second round in the epic. At that time, all fencing competitions were organised in pools. Mm -hmm. of six or seven or eight people in a pool sort of thing. And so you got, unlike now when we're straight into direct elimination mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing, direct elimination wasn't, wasn't, wasn't there at all. Mm -hmm. So um, it was, you know, uh, um, as I said, it was disappointing. Kind of, similarly, kind of in um, 68, um, I got injured uh, in, in fencing in the team epic. Uh, and was eliminated then kind of from competing further than that. Uh, in 72 then, we just purely gone to Epe and kind of, again, a second, I, remember, I think it was second round again there sort mm -hmm. of thing. Um, so my, my best results would have been outside the Olympics, you'd have to say. Sort of yeah, thing. yeah. And I, and I remember fondly to see now boasting sort of thing. I said, my single best result in, in, in an event and in any match was when I beat uh, Jean-Claude Magnon, who was at the time the world champion, foilist. Mm -hmm. So then kind of, uh, I was delighted with that, mind you, kind of, it's the French that's Where was that? In Paris, in the, the world champions in Paris okay. in, in, in 65. Always good, always nice to perform at the Worlds, all right, yeah, that's very nice. Um, yes. And so you, you hinted at it yourself, actually. So obviously the Olympics has, has a huge amount of pressure, but that's only a, a tiny fraction of where you're, you're fencing internationally through o over the years. Uh, what, what other results stick out to you? Or are there any other places that, that are fondly remembered? I mean, you're, you're fondly remembered them all, because I mean, there, it's a wonderful time. I mean, kind of, I mean, as I said, getting to the first international experience. I remember then in 64, we went to the, uh, again to the junior worlds in Budapest mm -hmm. uh, and had some kind of um, extraordinary happenings there kind of was all very strict all kind of very Soviet and all that sort of thing and I remember Colin O'Brien and I and everyone else we went for a walk one night and we climbed up this tower and you could see kind of walking around the bullet marks were still in all the buildings following the uh, uprising in 60, 68, wasn't it? But we went up and we went up this tower where we were met by an armed guard with a submachine gun who marched us both back to the hotel, sort of thing, as a dumpster out of there. Um, but um, the, the tournament finished with a, a um, big dinner, dinner dance and all that sort of thing. And for some reason or other, we were paired with the, the Soviets at the table and that sort of thing. So we were there and all this sort of fun going on. And there was always a commissar there who wasn't a fencer, kind of who kind of looking after the teams. And every time he appeared, suddenly about five pints were in front of me, plus several cigarettes. As one of his, <laughs> as one of his, his, his lads would do. And I and the, and the Russian girls did not attend. And I was like, why aren't you letting the girls? Why? And I kept badgering him. And eventually he turned to me and said, for 20 years I have been on the circuit and never in all that time I've met one so young to be so cheeky. <laughs> so, uh, well, you fit the profile of the Irish person with the five drinks in front of you, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't. That's what happened. Yeah. Um, 
And so more than just fencing, I mean, I'm sure you've met like plenty of world champions and or gone up against them or, or other Olympians. Have you any other memories that stand out? One of my favorite memories, I'd have to say, was in, it was in, in Mexico. And we were fencing in the team saber event. And we were not so rules. But mm -hmm. um, we were fencing Poland. And Poland were led by a fellow called Jerzy Pawlowski. Now, Jerzy was the first non Hungarian to win the Olympic gold medal, individual gold medal, since, oh, since, 19, since 1896, first one. Uh, he subsequently, interestingly enough, was arrested and charged with spying for the US of A and ended in jail. Um, but he's a lovely man. But he was fencing Colin O'Brien, and Colin, I remember, coming up and hitting him with a nepe hit on the wrist. And Babaski, a small man, beautiful man, takes off the mask and looks at his wrist with absolute amazement, and then went, <laughs> and then proceeded to destroy us all. So yeah, yeah, that sounds. <laughs> Yeah, Patricia kind of acknowledge yeah. that and uh, yeah. I'm going to finish the bout now, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, that was one of the ones. I remember also kind of, um, I think it would have been, in the Irish Open of 71 or 72 with Henry which um, in the epic final, which was an eight-man final, three of us were engaged in a series of barrages. Um, Michael Ryan, Jimmy Fox, and myself. And it went around and round where kind of um, Michael would beat me, I would beat Jimmy, and Jimmy would beat Michael. Uh, until eventually kind of I managed to beat Michael and went on to win it. But the thing about it, no, well, again, whether you recall, Jimmy Fox at the 1976 Olympics was the man who exposed Boris Onyshenko. Jimmy was a pentathlete. And you exposed Boris on each chink of a cheating where Boris was found to have a switch in his epic, which he could flick another. You, you remember that, but kind yeah, of, yeah. That, was, that was a huge scandal at the time. So that was another one. Yeah, I didn't uh, realize it was him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry? No, I didn't realize it was him who exposed it. Yeah, no, that's... I am. I am. Did you? Did you fancy Jimmy? Jimmy? Jimmy said, no, 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 that didn't happen. The lovely man again, Jimmy, kind of. Unfortunately, he, he ended up now with Parkinson's. Nice fellow. Um, so what do you mean? You met, but I mean, kind of certainly the 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 other kind of one well, of the other people you met kind of was a fellow called um, Nikanchikov, Nikolai Nikanchikov, who again won the world championships on a number of occasions. An absolute fabulous fence, happy fence, big big man, but a beautiful mover. I mean, I don't think I ever saw anyone who moved as well as Cassius Clay or Muhammad Ali. As far as as uh, did, and he was a Georgian, a very free spirit. I remember again, first came across him in uh, I think it was in Budapest, and um, when I was invited to join, kind of uh, a, a Russian party, when you learned kind of that if you produced anything in the communist era, it went on the table. So if you produced a bottle, the bottle went on the table. If you produced a pack of cigarettes. Cigarettes went on the table, so kind of, I learned that with other man. But he kind of got away with stuff which a lot of his fellow Russians did not, or Soviets did not, because he was so good. Mm. But obviously the pressure got to him, something, but at the age of 31, he put himself into a garage and put in, committed suicide by carbon monoxide poisoning. So, I mean, there are some of the outstanding people, you know, that I, that I rather remember. Whether this is all relevant to you now or not, no well, matter. No, it's, 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 I mean, that's quite sad to hear, but uh, it's interesting to hear the pressures that can that can go at that kind of level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Obviously, yeah. Be, being that good and getting away with things like that, but he still must have been under a huge amount of pressure. Um, put, I mean, one of the great things about the expensive internationally was you kept coming across the same people, you know, time and time again, which is great. You, you made friendships. Yeah. So, and um, th thinking about you know, your own style of fencing, um, was there a particular kind of style you enjoyed or, or disliked fencing against? Um, well, 
Uh, epi fencing, particularly, was evolving pretty much at the time. Epi had been uh, very much a defensive weapon. Uh, and the Italians were the best proponents of it and kind of a fellow called Mangiarotti kind of was a great man kind of and he'd sit on the piece there and do nothing and wait until kind of the opportunity arose and then and again he won the gold in the Rome Olympics I think it was and it started to evolve now um, being very unkind Michael would claim I'm probably being very unkind to him Michael Ryan would have been in that sort of mold and I always found it very difficult to 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 handle Michael Ryan I was more a foibus converted to an epius and therefore was more prone to attacking him, which, which I think in fairness, fencing evolved in that more that way. So kind of epi became a more offensive weapon. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I benefited from that. Okay. So, uh, so that was kind of, so I, you know, I was a, I was a converted foilus rather than a strict epius. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was, so when you came across the, the very technical epius kind of, I found them more difficult to do. And the, the the Russians in particular at that time, you know, kind of were, were very technically very, very, very strong. You know, kind of uh, they always produced, produced big, strong fellows sort of things. Mm -hmm. But um, I tend to be that bit, you know, kind of, certainly in the Irish scene, I tend to be that bit quicker. You know, okay. that was kind of where, where I got mm -hmm. and probably more competitive than the others. And so, I mean, maybe you've somewhat addressed it, but was there a particular favorite way to score a point? Obviously, obviously, the most the most flamboyant one was you know was the flesh. I had all three weapons. Now I know it can you can no longer do it, mm -hmm. uh, but that was that was the one kind of you often heard kind of you know kind of people sort of saying, "I knew you were coming with it. I knew you were coming with it. I couldn't stop you." You know, yeah. so that was. Yeah, um, yeah. No, it's a, it's a good injection of pace into it. A good change of rhythm and everything. Yeah, and no, it was very good, very good. Um, listen, John. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat to us today. Um, it's been really, really good chatting to you and hearing about your life in fencing and traveling around. Um, I'd also like to say a special thank you to Colin Flynn for research and editing and to Derva Foley for her instrumental help in creating this series. Thanks too to all of our viewers. If you'd like to see more, make sure to like and subscribe to Fencing Ireland. Don't forget, you can also find Fencing Ireland on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and on fencingireland.net. Thank you, goodbye.